there, I don't think there's any a, a time where Harry Potter looks at Voldemort and says, maybe he's right. No, that, that just never happened. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Richard Fox. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. There are handy links over in the sidebar on the right-hand side where you can subscribe to the show. You can find uh, all of the archives in a handy little drop-down list. Or there's a search bar where you can search for your favorite author and see if they have been on the show in these past uh, more than 400 episodes. Thank you to our sponsors for uh, allowing us to do this. And we've got some new sponsors coming on. Daniel Kenny, my favorite middle grade author, is just doing amazing things right now. He is publishing like a madman, uh, but he's putting out excellent, excellent books. Uh, I buy his books for my nieces and nephews uh, all the time. My my kids are a little older now, uh, but my nieces and nephews, I buy Daniel's books and put them in their hands. They are top shelf quality and really, really fun books. Uh, there's a link to Daniel's uh, Amazon page in the show notes, and uh, we're going to be highlighting uh, more of his books as we go on this month. But go visit Daniel Kinney and uh, buy his books for your uh, favorite kids, and they will love it. Roy M. Griffiths uh, has a new book, Bringing the Fire, the Lonesome George Chronicles, book two. Uh, Roy is really doing some amazing stuff in speculative fiction, and we're going to be highlighting more of those as the uh, month goes on. But go pick up uh, Roy's newest books. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you're a fan of alternative history uh, or war and military uh, thrillers, you're going to love these books. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, thanks to my buddies Nick and Jason from Galaxy's Edge uh, for sponsoring the show. Thanks for tuning in. As always, at the end of the show, we have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with book one, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE smackdown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl. Well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a debt. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together, and this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle, available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm really excited to have my friend Richard Fox on the show with me again. Richard was on uh, not quite a year ago. Uh, last end of last summer we chatted and uh, since then uh, since we talked last time Richard uh, went on to win uh, the Dragon uh, Award and has had a couple of really great collaborations that he started and uh, really uh, really adding to his uh, to his author library uh, you know in Richard Fox style uh, so uh, welcome back to the show Richard thank you Hank always a pleasure to be here I'm excited to have you back. Uh, so, yeah, a lot's a lot's been happening. Um, what's uh, what's new with you? Uh, how do you feel like your uh, your author uh, business and and the um, uh, the your repertoire 
Uh, how has it changed in this last year? Well, let's see. In the last year, I've, I've I did win the Dragon Award for best military science fiction and fantasy novel, which was a really surreal experience. And I, I got that. I got to chat with Larry Carrera. Afterwards was kind of the cherry on top of that that, that ice cream cone there. Yeah, and and that was for um, Iron Dragoons, right? That's right, for Iron Dragoons. And since since Iron Dragoons has been out, I, I've put out three more sequels, working on the fifth, which would be out in the end of July. And I've also uh, done two co-author series with the very talented Scott Moon and Josh Hayes. And my our first audiobook uh, done through Podium uh, through Josh Hayes and I's Terra Nova series has just come out. So it is never ending, which is great because blessed are the busy. <laughs> That's and right. a, a milestone I just uh, I just realized I, I crossed a few weeks ago was I am now a a seven figure author, which is kind of kind of surreal. Not something I ever you know planned on when I started writing, but now it's like I looked at all the numbers, like yeah, I'm over seven figures now. Oh my gosh, that's and that's insane. That's, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm I'm so happy that I, that my readers have enjoyed what I've been putting out so much that that you know they continue to to come back for for every every new story I put out there. So that's you know, it is humbling, and it's it's, uh, it's and it really helps me know that I'm, I'm kind of doing the right thing. That you know. Uh, you know, I keep putting books out every month or two or sometimes three if I'm slow, and uh, you know people appreciate it and people read it and I'm getting great reviews. So you know my readers are the best. I can't I wouldn't trade them for anything. So, so how long have you been publishing? I am coming up on uh, three years of uh, full time writing, but I've been publishing for about five years now. The first two years were not as successful as these last three. Well, and and we talked about this last time, uh, finding the niche that you could excel at, uh, and and you began writing some uh, kind of political thrillers and military thrillers, uh, and uh, what was it like for you uh, when you when you realized that military science fiction was was going to be the hot thing for you, um, and you obviously uh, the thrillers were were something you were passionate about. Or you wouldn't have written them to begin with, uh, but you know sometimes it's a you know when you realize this is the thing that's going to be successful, um, but is this the thing that's going to make me happy? Uh, and it sounds like you've really found the balance between those things because you wouldn't be as prolific and and building your 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 author business and brand the way you are if it wasn't providing some degree of happiness as well. No, it, it, writing the military science fiction is is very gratifying because it's fun. And um, I grew up with with Transformers and GI Joe and all those. And you know, there's you know, for a lot of uh, my readers who are about my age, you know, they know that feeling of when you know Optimus Prime shows up in the Transformers movie and throws down with Megatron. And you know, and for me, I, I like you know trying to bring that feeling back into what I'm writing. Where you know, like okay, let's get these you know these these heroes. Doing heroic things in a military manner, and then also let's throw in some jokes, you know, for military style jokes that I know you know a lot of my veteran readers uh, will appreciate. And it's but coming back to you know how I realized that was going to work. I, you know, when I first wrote the Ember War, I did not think it was going to work. I thought it was going to you know go out there and fall beneath the waves, just like everything else I, I had written before that. And and when it took off, and when I was you know I remember the first day I sold a hundred copies total. And I then went and woke my wife up, and she was she was less impressed than I was. And <laughs> don't wake your wife up in the middle of the night, gentlemen. All right, it, it never works out. But and you know, but then just being able to realize that hey, you know, there people really enjoy uh, what I'm putting out. And then the second book uh, was even was also very well received. And the subsequent, I think I'm up to like 28 books now. I, I I've, I've lost track, but um, it, it's wonderful. Because you know, like, I'm writing what I'm enjoying. My readers are enjoying what I'm writing, and so it, it works out for everyone. And I'm, I know I'm at the point where I cannot write these fast enough. And right. so, it- we were sitting in our living room last night, and my youngest son was uh, looking for something to watch on. Uh, I think it was Amazon Prime, and and he saw the newest Transformers movie uh, was out. The ones, but I, I guess came out in the theater last uh, summer. And I, I just kind of, you know, was not paying attention and, uh, like, you know, what's this, like the 18th uh, Transformers movie or, or something. And it just kind of poo pooed it and, uh, you know, wasn't paying attention. The next thing I know, like 15 minutes later, I am completely sucked in to this, you know, Transformers movie. And two hours later, uh, I was like, you know, that, 
that kind of, uh, I, I kind of liked it. And, uh, it goes back to what you were talking about a, a minute ago, you know, that, that we grow up loving this stuff. And, uh, you know, when you find something that uh, pushes those buttons for you and uh, you understand why people are consuming uh, you know, a military sci-fi the way that they are and uh, why the market is just ultra hot right now. There's uh, there's just something really entertaining about it. There is. And it's also, you know, c- satisfying to you know to have a proper good versus evil battle and have you know have it resolved the way you kind of want it to yeah so i mean that doesn't mean that good guys win all the time but you know it's you could still have that you know that that throwdown and at the end people can be like yes you know the good has evil and and people can appreciate that well, speaking of that you know there's a, a lot of debate uh, especially in fantasy fiction right now it seems to be uh in, well in science fiction too but uh that, I had this conversation a lot about fantasy fiction that uh, we're tending to get away from uh, the the black and white good versus evil. You know where the uh, good guys come in and, and you can you know that 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 good is going to prevail. Uh, the, the tendency now is to have a lot of really gray characters and no one uh, really has any good motivation whatsoever. They're just everything is done from a selfish point of view and. Uh, you know, people, authors have built entire series over really morally ambiguous characters. Um, what do you think about that? And, uh, and, and what do you think about, uh, you know, having books that, that still, um, kind of stand for something without being preachy and, you know, just being heavy handed? Well, I, I, I do like, um, you know, morally ambiguous characters from time to time, so long as they, are not the main character. Uh, I grew up with Star Trek D Space Nine, and my favorite character in that whole series was Garrick, the the Taylor the Taylor spy, uh, Cardassian there, and he was my favorite. And you know where he was on any issue, kind of you didn't really know. And when he would show up in an, in an episode, it was always fun. Now, if you would have a whole series about Garrick doing Garrick things, not as exciting because it's hard for anyone to to really latch on to Garrick. Because he's so morally ambiguous, and I think you know readers by and large, you know, we all deep down, we all believe we're good people, and for us to go and say, oh no, no, I identify with this horrible villain, you know, you, you get this little cognitive dissonance where I was like, you know, I think I'm great. Meanwhile, I like this character that everyone agrees is a scumbag. So, and and you like him because he's a scumbag. So it, it's harder for I think readers and just anyone to to really you know, identify with. And root for the villain because you know deep inside we're all good people. So, but you know, as for going for kind of that moral gray area, it, I would look back to all of of history of of storytelling is where we don't get. You, know, you go back to Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a hero. He was the first hero, and ever since then, you know, storytelling has focused on heroes, uh, you know, and stories as a moral lesson. If you look into the the uh, the hero's journey. Um, that's been, you know, there's lots of information about that out there. So I think, you know, you know, even look at Harry Potter. Was there any moral gray area with Harry Potter? I don't believe so. You know, he was confused at time. That's part of the growing up as his character. But uh, there was no, there, I don't think there's any a, a time where Harry Potter looks at Voldemort and says, maybe he's right. No, that, that just never happened. So, so I, I believe the reading public, you know, readers at large appreciate when you, when you can have a hero who you know they can struggle along the way. That's you know otherwise it's boring. So you know, that they struggle is fine. That they get tempted to go to the other side is fine. But if you have you know, if you're focusing on the villain, or if you ever have a hero that never commits, you're, it's kind of like what what are you doing here? And like I remember I watched uh, what was it the that it was on Netflix. It was uh, oh uh, carbon carbon something altered carbon. Alter Carbon, yes. I'll edit that part out. I, I was watching <laughs> Alter Carbon, and the protagonist of the series was very wishy-washy about what he was even going to do through most of the episodes. It wasn't until like the last two episodes he decided to finally step up and be the character he was supposed to be. And for ten episodes, I'm just sitting there going, why am I still watching this? But I, I got to the end. So, yeah. Well, you know, talking about uh, DS9, you know, at, at no point uh, are you ever unclear about the mission of uh, Starfleet, you know, that mm-hmm. uh, 
uh, yeah, we've, we've got characters all around that, that have their own motivations and all that. But the, the overarching system of the story uh, is, uh, you know, is known. And, uh, and, and Harry Potter is a great example because, uh, you know, he's on a trajectory and he, he, uh, dodges back and forth as he's growing up and learning and going through adolescence. Uh, but, but there's never any doubt that, that he's going to prevail and that, uh, uh, you know, good is ultimately going to win. Um, that was a, uh, a rabbit trail about good versus evil, but I, I think, uh, I think it needs to be talked about now. No, it's, it, you know, the, 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 the conflict between good and evil is, you know, as old as storytelling itself. So, and, and having stories like that are always, you know, entertaining. Now, like my new series about the Terran Armor Corps, the, 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 one of the antagonist forces is, uh, this uh, a group of people called the Abara Nation. And it's very ambivalent, kind of what they're actually after. But, you know, but the, the main character, Roland, is told, this is your enemy. And then after a while, Roland is captured. He, he, he sees what this enemy is up to. And then, you know, and he's put in a very you know, hard, you know, he's put in a very difficult decision that he has to make later on in the series. And as the series progresses, there's a little bit of who is the real enemy here, and that that answer will will come about. But and it's also kind of the one of the overarching arcs of that series is you know who is your enemy and how do you deal with them. And so you know while this series has a little bit, it's like oh, I thought they were bad. No, not maybe they're not real bad if you get to know them. <laughs> However, there are definitely bad actors in this series. Right. right. So. So Iron Dragoons was that the first? Um, and that's the the Terran Armored Corps uh, series. Was was that the first military sci-fi that you wrote? No, the first was uh, the Ember War. Okay, that's right. And, and and that was a nine book series. And then I. Uh, I did the uh, Exiled Fleet series, which is uh, which was put on hiatus until I finished the Terran Armor Corps because after Iron Dragoons won the Dragon Award, it was taking up all the attention. So, yeah. uh, but that series will be finished. Yeah. What did that do for you, winning the award? Uh, did that raise uh, awareness about your series and and you as a writer? Did, was that a a beneficial thing to you ultimately? It sure was, and now I, I did something which proved to be uh, rather fortuitous. Is that before you know when it was nominated, and I knew the week that it was going to come out. I did not plan on winning, but I went to a bunch of other authors and said, "Hey, um, Iron Dragoons is going to be free during this time period, right after the award comes out. Would you please tell your folks about it?" And they said, "Okay, sure." And I just thought, well, you know, at least it would go with it's been nominated. For, for this award and then it, people would tell it goes free and then that would garner some attention but then it won and then all these authors could say hey this one just won best military science fiction book go get it for free and I think I had like something like 40,000 downloads that week which was you know which was a real boost because at the same time the second book in the series had just come out so I had I had a very good month that month and but and then also you know it's you know, so I've got the I got the award sitting up on my my uh, on top of my the upper part of my desk here. So you know, every time I feel like you know, I, every time I write, I get to this point of they're going to hate it. This is the book that's going to destroy me. Everyone's going to hate it. And then I look up at the award. I'm like, no, no, I'm I'm okay. Okay, people people like it, but but still, every book every, I, I get this this incredible self doubt is like this is the huge mistake. But and you check you your, have to power. You check your KDP dashboard and you just turn into Sally Field. You like me. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the market says I'm good. Okay, I can keep <laughs> <Right>. going. <laughs> uh, so when you uh, when you started writing the Ember War, uh, was the, that was the the first book that that saw the success you were talking about, where you sold more than 100 copies a day? Was that on the first book, or did you have a couple out before you kind of started reaching that critical mass? Now, that was the first military science fiction book, and, and that's the one that was selling. Wow. Did yeah. you did you plan on that being uh, the, the series that it became and then ultimately the spinoffs? I, I, it's probably hard to, to foresee that. Uh, but at what point did you realize, OK, I need to capitalize on this and uh, and continue the story? Well, I I knew how the Ember was going to end. Like I had said, I knew everything in the first and second book. And then I kind of and I knew this would go between seven and nine books. And, and I had that. That last scene in mind, where all the all the characters from the very beginning of the book, or some of the characters from the beginning of the book, are standing in this very strange place, 
the galaxy is completely different, and humanity is now kind of like, what do we do now? So I knew I, I had to get to to that point. So I had the end game in mind. And then while I was writing it, I had I put in a couple trap doors for you know other series set in the same universe. You know what happens right after the Ember War? What happens when these characters go to this dwarf galaxy? And what's about these side? You know this what are the, but these other stories of you know a different side of you know of a uh, of the whole the whole universe because Iron Dragoons follows the armor soldiers, these soldiers who plug their brains into giant suits and fight. And then there's another series which is just about strike marines, which are you know they're they also fight, but they fight you know just in normal clothes, not normal normal powered armor. So you know, writing it, I you know I, I had the end game in mind, and then I also made sure you know, okay, here's what I'm going to write next after your know, book nine finishes. So, and I made I did a huge mistake when I was writing the Ember War that I thought okay, let me write something completely different. Um, and I wrote this uh, young adult science fiction kind of sweet romance uh, book called The Queen of Sidonia, which I put out under a pseudonym, under a pen name, and, which is just flopped completely. And I later brought it back under my own name, and it's not done as well. But you know, I, lesson learned was that if you have something that people like, you keep giving people what they like. And I decided, oh, I got this great thing. Let me write something else. And w- what had happened is, you know, I, I finished the Ember War, I was in editing, and I was writing the Queen of Sidonia, and I was halfway through that when the Ember War came out. And I was torn between: do I write the sequel? Do I finish this 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 young adult book? And I decided to finish the young adult book, which was a mistake. But you know, lesson learned. Yeah. Well, d- do you think as as an author um, that you can't uh, switch genres? Uh, you know, or is that a decision that you just have to make and say, uh, I'm, I'm going to lose my my typical audience with this book? But, um, you know, do, do you ever foresee a place where it's worth it to break ranks and go do something else, you know, for a little bit and come back? Yeah, not for me, because momentum really matters in publishing. And, you know, keeping that momentum going of putting up, you know, you got your audience, they're excited you give them a new book every 60 to 90 days and you know, you'll be rewarded with happy readers. Amazon will reward you with algorithms that sell your books and then you'll be rewarded ultimately with dollars, which means freedom to not have to go and sit in a cubicle somewhere. So, you know, momentum matters. Keep up the momentum. Now, uh, towards the end of last year, my wife and I, we had our, our third child and, uh, we, and we also have, to, and the, the other two boys are quite young. So, you know, while, you know, the, this baby's coming, you know, I realized, OK, but uh, my focus is not going to be so much in getting the books out just as fast as I can. And thankfully, I had I was working with two co-authors and we and during that there's uh, this period between when the third Iron Dragoon book came out, uh, we put out four more books within the Ember War universe. And then my fifth, my fourth book in the Terran Armor Corps series had it, it just came out. So, you know, that that kept me. Uh, in in the algorithms that kept me you know viable to my audience, I didn't just say see you in six months, um, good luck. And then you would, meanwhile, my readers kind of forget about me. So I, that's not the situation that happened. So, but definitely you know staying with you know w- w- what's working uh, is is important. So and I, for me to, to, to for would I go and write in a different genre right now? No, I wouldn't. Um, I'm focused on getting the Ember Wars series are done, and then I'll write you know more. You know, more books in a similar vein of space opera, military sci-fi, space adventure fiction. Well, yeah, I think some people would would get discouraged when they hear that because uh, you know some people may feel like, well, I don't want to write this the same thing for the rest of my life. But I've kind of pigeonholed myself in this. Um, but you know, um, you know, storytelling is uh, it, it. It kind of doesn't matter what the window dressing of the genre is uh, you can tell all kinds of stories within military sci-fi and space opera. I, I mean, look at star Wars, star Wars versus star Trek. You know, if we're talking about kind of two big space opera kind of things and star Trek kind of straddles that line between military and space opera kind of, you know, there, there's elements uh, of both there. Uh, and, and you can tell very different stories within that, uh, within that genre. Uh, so if you're a good writer, a good storyteller, you can cover that emotional, uh, you know, width and breadth 
and and tell all kinds of stories. Just because you're using the the genre tropes uh, doesn't mean you have to tell the same story over and over again. Right, and it was Isaac Asimov said that you know every any story could put a sci-fi mask on, right, and and be told. So and that that's certainly true. Now I I like to joke that I would you know someday write. 800 page books about Napoleon's Marshall set during the Napoleonic Wars. And I could, I mean, and, but my readers would be like, no, thank you. And so that I would, I would spend, you know, years editing or researching and writing this book that would sell 50 copies. So, and, and you, right now I still have bills, which is why I, I those books are, are you know, th- those, the idea for those books remains on the shelf. So, yeah, but you could, you could tell that type of story, uh, within military sci-fi and, and make something really cool and unique. Well, certainly. Like, if you look at uh, David Weber's Honor Harrington series, he's even said it's Horatio Hornblower in right. space. Exactly. So could you do Napoleonic Wars in space? Well, certainly. You could put – you could have almost any story and just tack in space on there with it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I just want – I want people to, to kind of think outside the box if they're, if they're thinking that uh, – uh, you know that that everything has been done within a genre. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. If as long as there are writers with imaginations, the you know the the canvas is wide open. I, yeah, I don't. We're not done telling stories. Absolutely. I mean, so. Yeah. Um, so tell me a, bl- a little bit about your collaborations that you've been doing with uh, with Josh and Scott. Uh, that has really, uh, as you said, uh, you know, enabled you to. Uh, to keep within the algorithms and to keep the, the, the ball rolling um, from a creative perspective. Uh, what is it like working with a co-author? Uh, I'm, uh, I guess you've, before these collaborations, you'd never collaborated on a, on a book or series before, had you? No, not before this. I had not. So, so how did you approach it from the beginning? Um, you know, how do you kind of stake out territory and how do you make sure that your, uh, series is going to maintain the tone that you have set as an author. Uh, everybody brings their own little flavor to things. Uh, and, and we all probably expect that a collaboration is going to have a little different flavor, but it's always going to have some Richard Fox in it. Uh, so how do you maintain that and how did you go about setting it up? It's well, The good news is that this is a, the, the universe that I created. So you know, I, I, I may not realize all the details, but when I when I say well you know when I've realized the details, well it's legitimate because it's coming from me. So when when I'm working with Scott and Josh, is I, I I know the tone, I know how you know the the universe works. So that's it's easier because it's, it's coming from me. Now if if Scott and Josh and I sat down and tried to do something completely new and different, it would be tough because we would both have a, a different idea of what happened, you know, previous to this or how the tech might work. So when you're working within something that's established and they both had read or listened to every single one of the books, so it was easy. They knew the background. They knew, you know, all, all the lore there. And so that was that was easier. And then how it, you know, I, I put in uh, a great deal of work, as do Scott and Josh, to, to all these books. So, you know, when I'm going through the manuscript and I realize, okay, this is how this character would have added this, I can go in there and add this. And then, like, with Josh – or excuse me, Scott is working on a book right now um, – called Valder's Hammer, which has a lot of a character named Valder in it. And I've just said, there's these space battles here, here, and here. I'll write those. And then like, and then there's, at one point, Valder has this uh, this scene with another character who I want to talk about. And I just, I'll handle that part because I knew exactly how that's going to work out. And now there's, there's also when they're, you know, they work off an extensive outline that, that I, that I write up for, for each of these books. And they'll come back to me and say, hey, what if we add this, that, and the other thing? And I will almost always say, run with it. Because, you know, if, if they, you know, they're working on the story too, and if they feel like something, oh, and the muse is talking to them, I'm like, yeah, go for it, go for it. We'll see how it happens. Now, that doesn't always work out. There's a couple of times I'll be like, why is this here? And they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, and uh, they both, you know, they know me so well that they kind of are like, Richard's not going to like that. So, right, right. that rarely happens. Talk a little bit about your um, your outlining uh, process because I, I know from the last time we talked, you're a, a pretty in depth outliner and uh, working with your collaborations, uh, you've got to you've got to keep the, the the trains running on time, so you need something to 
uh, to work from so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, from when, when a story idea is beginning, uh, how do you go about your outlining process to get it all out and planned? Right. It's when I start outlining, I, I start with a question of what this book is about. Like I'm writing uh, a book in the Air, the Terran Armor Corps series right now called The Last Aeon. And the question for for this is, you know, how do you convince the last member of an alien species to come help you? And then, you know, so, okay, so there's the question that I have there. And then, you know, I also know where this is going to feed into the whole rest of the series. So, you know, I, I, then I envision some key scenes, like when uh, Mark Ibarra goes and talks to this, 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 this alien. And then, you know, when these bad guys show up and then there's a problem in space. And then, you know, how then I, I just know the high points of that whole story arc. And then I'll have another arc that gets worked in with uh, other armored characters. I know they're going to be fighting on this planet and they're not having a good time. So like, okay, we you know, where you know, there's, there's a fight in these woods. There's uh, and then how does this end? And it, you know, like, what's that? And then at, I always keep in mind, what's the call to the next book? Because if you, you know, I have the last day on, it answers the question of how do you get this this alien to help you, and it also poses the question for the next book, which is, you know, what happens when you, somebody who should be your who should be your ally is not your ally at the moment is in trouble. Do you go help them, or do you you know do you let them deal with sleep in the bed that they made? So, so every book is you know answering a question and then posing the next question, and then so I'll have my high points and I'll go through and I'll add in you know okay you know beats to that major scene, you know. Okay, if when this character meets the 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 Aeon, all right, you know she's not happy to see them at first. This is how he convinces her to help. This is how she gets interested, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then you know generally my outlines are about you know four to six thousand words for any book, and those will translate into a book that's sixty to seventy thousand words long. Do you then take that outline and and just flesh out the points uh, from there, uh, and and how true do you stay to your outlines? I. I pretty true i mean i say like the end result is about 80 percent correct from from what i outline now the muse happens you know sometimes i'll be i'll be doing something and then when the character will will, will, will get away from me and like it say something like why are you doing? Oh, and that just happens so and it's fun when that happens and like I, I i wrote a book about the red baron and i i created this 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 scene that has no basis in history where the red baron um he he crash lands next to uh, another crashed uh, english plane and you know, the, the the English pilots, one has been killed, and the other one starts beating the heck out of the out of the Red Baron because he just killed his friend. And then Lothar, the Red Baron's brother, uh, also lands nearby and it tackles the English pilot and ends up killing him. And I, and that was a surprise because I'd written that scene before for for screenplays, and it, and, and Lothar hadn't killed that English pilot, but in this one he pulls the knife out and stabs him. I was like, what the heck? And I realized that's what Lothar would have done because Lothar was a pretty, you know, he was a brutal guy. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll keep it. So when things like that happen, you you just let it. It's it's no big deal. And but for when I for outlining, I I, I have my slug lines. If if you know screenwriting, it just says, you know, it's like you know, it'll be like Roland and Ibarra go to the hut. And then, I'll, you know, then I keep that slug line there, and I write that, write the scene out. And what's nice about the slug line is I put them in brackets. So later on, when it's time to rearrange the story, and and make it flow, and you know, you know, pacing, um, I can just do a control F for that open bracket, and then find where all these scenes are, and then move them around as I need to. Nice. That's a, that's a yeah. handy little trick. It is help, yeah, because there's no reason to have an open bracket key or symbol in any manuscript. So when you do control F for that, you're only finding something that has to be taken out. Nice. Nice. Every, that's the sound of everybody making notes. Uh, yep. <laughs> oh man. Um, you talked about adding that, uh, that call forward, uh, at the, at the end of every book, uh, that, that's set up for the next book. Uh, military sci-fi. Do you, do you feel like the readership for that, uh, is, uh, I, I don't want to use the word trained because that, that's, uh, that's an awful connotation. Uh, but do, do you feel like those those readers expect that and are are looking that uh, you know this is uh, in in this genre? There's not a lot of standalone books. This is uh, these usually are, are big series telling big huge stories. Um, it, is the the readership uh, expecting those things from the books you put out? 
it's uh, it, people appreciate series, and uh, I think a lot of people have done the math that series sell well. And but I have noticed that the, the three worst words you can end a book with are "to be continued," mm-hmm. because it it irks the heck out of people. Now you can leave, you can end with a bit of a, a cliffhanger to decide, well, what's going to happen next, and that and you know, people appreciate that. But when if you stop in the middle of a battle, or if you stop with someone hanging off a cliff, people don't appreciate that, yeah, because and because a lot of writers are not as fast as I am. And like if, if I say, you know, oh, here there, these people are in the middle of a fight, they're in some real trouble, you're going to have to wait 60 days. Okay. G.R.R. Martin, uh, he's been, how long has he been left in, leaving us hanging about well, what happened to Jon Snow at the end of his last book? You know, long enough to put out a complete TV series of books <laughs> he hasn't even written yet. That's how long. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that, but that should be every author's nightmare. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's, it's up to him. So I, so no, there's not a lot of standalone military science fiction books. It's, it's true, and and a lot of times with the length of a, st- a story, be it in many books or just one, it depends on your villain. And you know, if you're writing a story about a kid dealing with a, a bully that lives across the street, you could deal with that in, in a short story. If you're writing about a galactic invasion across the entire galaxy you're not going to fix that in 300 books or 300 pages excuse me so the villain uh, does you know is is important part if you look at um honor harrington again that those books have been out for 25 years i believe it's certainly i'm sure someone will correct me and uh, and uh, honor harrington still has not uh, made manticore safe so <laughs> Well, let's talk about villains for a minute. What makes a really great villain? Uh, because, uh, you know, we, we talked in the beginning about the, the black and white. And, uh, you know, you don't want a villain that is just so cliche, you know, uh, mustache twirling, you know, uh, uh, you know, a villain right out of, uh, uh, you know, a cartoon or something. Uh, so how do you create villains that that stand the test of a series and keep the reader engaged and wanting to mo- know more about them. What you the villain needs to have power. The villain needs to be strong, so strong that it, you don't think the hero is going to beat him. Yeah. And if, if you can't have a weak villain, you can't have a villain that's that, that the readers pity or aren't impressed with. Uh, let, let's compare Darth Vader to Kylo Ren. All right. Now, Do we have you, to? Yes, we do. Okay. And so you have Darth Vader, and the first time we see him in Episode Four, he, you know, he's holding a. You, you could tell he's strong because he's holding a dude up with one arm, and then he snaps his neck, and throws him against the wall. So you, you pretty quick you realize, oh, this guy means business. If you take a step back to Rogue One, the first we see Darth Vader in action. What does he do? He whips out his lightsaber and just cuts down guys left, right, and sideways. And you're right. like, yeah, this guy, this guy means business. You you got to watch out for him. He's tough. And then. You know, as we see Darth Vader throughout, you know, the original trilogy, he's strong. He is tough. It is, you know, when you think, how's Luke going to beat him after, you know, uh, Darth Vader is basically toying with him on Cloud City and whacks his hand off. So, it, you know, when at that final victory, it's like, yeah, that was a good villain. Why? Because it was tough to beat. Now you look at Kylo Ren. And and when we first see him, what does he do? He just, he just chops down some old man. And then he throws te- temper, temper tantrums, and then he loses. And then he loses to a girl. Okay, you know, you know a girl. Quality aside, a, a girl a, five minutes ago that had no power. Yeah, who had never touched a lightsaber before in her life. It's like, come on. And, and, then, and then when you see him in the, the second movie, which I unfortunately had to watch, and he's he's still he's just he's a, he's a he's a whiner. He's kind of weak. He doesn't really know what 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 he's doing, and it's just like Kylo Ren is not a, you know, he's not a, a compelling villain. So, so your your villains need to, you know, one be strong enough that it's a it's a problem for the the hero to beat, and then two, sure enough in their own purpose that they're always going to be at odds with with your hero. Because if you had the point where like the the your villain's like, oh, you know what, you're right, I'm coming to your side, and there's, there's no fight, it's kind of like, well, what was the point of all that? So, um, do you ever uh, feel the the uh, 
the desire to write in uh, maybe current events or maybe uh, your take on uh, a, a certain world situation in a fictionalized way in in your books. Uh, do you do you feel that authors need to weigh in on things, or can writing just be entertainment? It's you you can you could write message fiction and be entertaining at the same time. Now, and I'll, I'll hearken back to um, Heinlein with Starship Troopers. Yeah. Now the the. The legend behind Starship Troopers is that Heinlein saw an article about how the U.S. was was doing a treaty with a nuclear treaty with the Russians, and he was all upset about it. And so, in three weeks, he wrote Starship Troopers, which is entertaining and also has a lot of, you know, why Western civilization is n- number one to it. And that book has has stood up; it has generated a lot of discussion over the years. So, you know, do I feel the urge? Yeah, sometimes I do. Now, like. And what I would like to do before 2020 is write uh, a book called Influx, which is about where, where Mars is established as its own colony and a whole bunch of people from Earth show up. And you, it's, it's, you can think of uh, is Pocahontas meets uh, the moon is a harsh mistress on Mars. Now, that sounds crazy, but in my head it's much better right now. So, <laughs> And, and that, that kind of discussion, that kind of book would all be about um, – you know, integration and what it happens when you know different cultures you know try to try to live in the same area so which is a very topical uh, discussion that we're having right now around us now would I write it in such a way that it's like you know you would look and say oh that is definitely Trump that is definitely Sanders that is definitely Pelosi no 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 I would change it you know change it enough that you know you could you could put in you could see the discussion about immigration there. But it wouldn't be so so shallow. That is just you know a retelling of a Newsweek article with sci-fi. Right. Um, you know we have. Uh, I'm trying to to word this. Uh, we have all seen or been involved in some uh, Facebook or Twitter uh, debacle where people are screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, and, and calling each other evil and, and all manner of names. And, and you leave that discussion, if you can call it that, and, and no one has changed their mind. No one, uh, uh, if anything, everyone is only rooted deeper in what they already thought going into the conversation. Uh, fiction uh, allows us to step away from our passions a little bit, maybe takes the the human faces off of the argument and, uh, and maybe allows us to think about things that we were not prepared to think about. Do, do you think that's what Starship Troopers and ultimately the, the stories that we tell uh, allows us to do to kind of remove ourselves from it, to, to then uh, you know, let the prejudices go uh, so that you can think about things? It's, you know, I, I was a history uh, major in, in college and stay with me. This is relevant. Okay. And we, we used to say is that uh, the great thing about history is that the people you write about can't argue with you. <laughs> so if if you've got a book and you're engrossed in this story and it, and if it's, it's it's done in an entertaining way, uh, you're not feeling that urge to say no, author, you're wrong. And that author doesn't come back to the page and say no, 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 this is where you're wrong and you're both stupid. And so that doesn't happen when you're reading. You you don't have that back and forth versus Facebook and Twitter. You know, you you've got a, a couple characters to get your point across, and then you can have the conversation gets muddled with a bunch of other discordant voices. So when you when you've got the book, you know you you you're it's nice and calm. Right. You can put out the whole story. Nobody you know nobody shows up on page seven and taps you on the shoulder and says that's wrong. So <laughs> it's uh, so when you, if you if you're writing a book that has messages to it, you, you're in a good spot because you can get the whole argument out without you know being interrupted now afterwards discussion can ensue that's no problem and now but as for any kind of message fiction if, if you're not entertaining first and if you it, you're you're wrong and you're, you're going to fail as a, as a writer and entertainer if you're if you're just trying to you know make the message the story right you, know, you need to be entertaining first and then have you know whatever message you're doing whatever theme you're having is also in there yeah. nobody likes to be you know browbeaten and told this is what you have to believe 
hear 400 pages of, of, you know, bad prose. You know, it's just no one likes that. Well, we call that literary fiction. Yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so it's just, you know, it's it's all message all the time and yeah. no fun. So, uh, we know, that that's one reason I think that, uh, that Heinlein uh, stands the test of time is he was a really entertaining writer. And we like to go back to those stories because we like the stories. We like the characters. We like the action. And uh, it feels good. You know, and then if we if we get some discussion out of it, that's that's great. That's awesome. Um, but it's a fun book to read. First Certainly. and foremost. Yeah. Um, we talked a little about your uh, writing and publishing schedule earlier and, and uh, you know, what the collaborations allowed you to, to take some some time that you needed. Uh, we uh, you know, we have a, a lot of mutual friends uh, that are, you know, really killing it in this space uh, right now. Some of them. Uh, you know, have have discovered that that if they publish every thirty days, uh, you know, great things happen. Some of our friends are, are publishing uh, more often than that. Some are two or three months. Uh, in your experience, what does that what's that sweet spot look like for you? Do, do you think that you have to be churning out books every thirty days? Uh, is is quarterly enough? What's what's the market like right now? I, I would say that ninety days or quarterly is the minimum. Okay. To, to having books out because this, because Amazon has a 30 day cliff which seems to be getting shorter and shorter as time goes on a uh, 30 60 90 day cliff where you know they're the algorithms are selling the book for you so after 90 days for people to go and find that book again is very difficult to do so organically so if, if you can put out a book every 30 days you're 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 at the top of the game and you'll be rewarded with visibility and dollars so which is always nice if you want to buy a hot dog so, but uh, sixty. If you could keep up with sixty days, I think you'll you'll have a a, a a viable career. And now there's a couple people who have done something very smart, which is to write a bunch of books, and then hold them and then release them every thirty days. And that's it's a it's a wonderful business model. But then you have to follow it. So right. if you've got if you've got four books saved up, and, and then you put one out every month, in those four months you had better write another book and have it out. And then get to the point where you can churn, put out books on a regular schedule. Right. Do you feel like it's more important to uh, write consistently and publish every 60 days uh, than writing uh, a whole bunch, saving up, putting them out 30 days, than having to take a, a period of time off while you stack up the next series? Do, do you think that if you could write and publish every 60 days but do that consistently – do you think that would be better than the other model? It's I, I prefer the consistent 60 days. Yeah. Now, if, if somebody out there is, has not entered into the market yet with your books, I would say save up your books, put them out, and then get on the 60-day treadmill of, of, of publishing. That That's a very sustainable model because what happens is if you put out books one, two, three, four over the course of four months, it takes you another year to write those books. You're going to fall off everyone's radar. The algorithms aren't doing anything for you. And then, you know, your monthly income is going to, to, to bottom out. So as uh, I, you know, there's we talk about spikes and tails. You know, you got your sales spike from when a book comes out and then you got that long, very long tail of when it continues to sell. And if you're putting out books every 60 days, you know, it, it gets people looking at your backlist. So like, you know, every time I put out a new Armor Core book, it makes sales of book one go up. Why? Because people look at book four and say, oh, that's interesting. Let me go back to book one and read that and see if I want to keep going. Right, right. And it makes sense because if you discover a new TV show on, on Netflix, uh, and, and uh, we're really bad about this. I won't watch anything on TV until I know there are several seasons of it. But there's nothing worse than getting invested in something that is canceled or, or mm -hmm. getting really into something. And then you've got to wait all summer before the thing even launches again. And, you know, I'm, I'm just not about that life. Uh, but you know, nobody ever finds something on Netflix and says, Oh, let me start with season six. And then, uh, <laughs> you, you know, that, that's not the way you do it. So right. uh, it, it would, it makes perfect sense that the, the first lead off in the series would always be a hot seller. You would think. Yeah. And starting a new series, it, it does get a lot of attention. People are like, Oh, what's this? This is, you know, and then versus coming across book five later on. And then, then people are a little. You know, where am I getting in? But people, there's a lot of people who like getting into a new series right as it starts and then go, being along with that series throughout its whole life. 
you you feel like you you're an original fan. You're the OG for <laughs> for something. Right. Oh man, uh, Josh uh, Hayes, uh, me and uh, Steve Bowyer uh, started this other podcast where we're reading the Wheel of Time uh, and and podcasting. It was just a, a goofy little project that we that we thought about uh, because none of us had ever read it, and, and we're all interested in fantasy and stuff like that. But man, we have encountered some rabid people that uh, that are the OGs that were there from the beginning. And they're still riding that train, and uh, that's that's a that's an interesting reader uh, when you meet those folks. Yep. Yep. And yeah, th- those folks, you know, they they they've got ownership. Yes. And those are your those are very passionate people. Yes. <laughs> about something, and, and it, it, what's great about those fans is that if you make a mistake, they'll let you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you you can fix yourself pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh. Speaking of Josh, I asked him this morning, I said, so uh, so Richard and I are about to talk. Um, is there anything I should harass Richard about? And, uh, and Josh said, hmm. And then he said, writing new scenes at the last minute. Oh, you, you, you want to no tell me what that's about? It's, uh, <laughs> you know, while we're, you know, we, we have these publication dates that we have in mind that we've told people about. And then as we're going through the end of a, going through the manuscript, you know, it would be kind of glaring that you know, we need something here. And while we were doing Terra Nova, I was looking like, okay, we need a ground fight here to explain why there's nobody up in the space to fight. So I, I went to Josh and said, we need this scene, 6,000 words, give it to me. So he busts his butt, <laughs> writes it, sends it back to me, and I'm reading it. I'm like – and then I, I realized where I had screwed up is that you know he focused the whole story on these characters that we'd never seen before. <laughs> So it's like, you know, for the reader to suddenly be, you know, here's a bunch of new people care about them, you know, two thirds of the way through the book is like, OK, this is this is not good pacing. So I, I I rewrote the I rewrote that scene, trimmed it down a bit and then, you know, just kept it focusing on the pew pew and the, and the explosions instead of, you know, the, the, the tribulations of these new characters in there and then just kind of push those new characters to the end of the book. It's like a pop up later. So, you know, that, you know, th- that's the kind of thing that, you know, when you're new to collaborations, this is what will happen. So, you know, we didn't have this with uh, with uh, the the second book in the series. We're not having the third book of the series. It's you know the, these kind of things will will happen. So, gotcha. but but the good news is, is that you know it's fixed beforehand. It's not like the book comes out and people are like, you know, the third act was missing X, Y, and Z. I was like, <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> oh man! Speaking uh, of that collaboration with Josh, the that you mentioned it at the top of the show, uh, Terra Nova. Uh, You've got the new audio. Uh, I think they they put books one and two, and Luke Daniels uh, narrated. Uh, I, I listened to the sample. It's in my my queue. I just haven't gotten down to listen to it yet. But um, uh, how do you feel about the the Luke Daniels production? Oh, Luke Daniels is amazing. Oh yeah, and he was he was just incorpor- He was just uh, put into the Audible Narrator Hall of Fame as he so, should, as he should, because he's so very talented oh. and. And uh, so every time, you know, Luke Daniels is, is going to read my stuff, I'm like, I'm not worthy. You know, yeah. his, anytime people are always like, oh, we love the audiobook, and I say, it's all Luke Daniels. It's all him, you know. And, and so the more, and, you know, the more we can, I can have him working on my stuff, the happier I am. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, he's amazing there. And, and narrator's not even a, a great title. I mean, he's, uh, he's a voice actor. He, he mm-hmm. puts, he builds characters for every one of these. And it, if you, if you're not familiar with Luke Daniels' work, uh, you need to go look him up. If you're not an audiobook fan, Luke will make you an audiobook fan. Oh, it, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what's uh, what's coming up next from you, Richard? Um, I, I know that uh, you've got you know, pots boiling on on all burners right now, but uh, kind of uh, what's the release schedule uh, coming up? It's in July of 2018. I'll have uh, the fifth book of the Terran Armor Corps series come out. Along with the third book of the Terran Strike Marine series, those will both be out in July. Uh, what, and then for the rest of 2018, um, the Terran Armor, the Terran Strike Marine, Terran Armor Corps, and Terra Nova, lots of Terra going on. <laughs> those three series uh, will will should be complete by the end of 2018. And and then I'm going to go back and write two books for the Exile Fleet series, and and then from there uh, I have a three book series planned, which is it's. Right now, I'm pitching it as V, set in the 1980s, but humans are the lizard people. 
It makes much more sense on my my, my outline, but uh, did, I'm sure a lot of readers, listeners are going, what? Right now. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. Where are the lizard people? No. And But as for collaborations, you know, um, with, with Josh and Scott, I told them, look, this is this is only going to go five books. And I, I don't think I was I was ever ready to do the um, Brian Herbert, uh, right. Kevin J. Anderson, sort of, you know, three decade long bromance of Dune. I was I'm not quite ready to do that with anyone. So so I so I told them both, look, you're going to do five books with your we'll do five five books. And then if you can go your own your own way, maybe we'll do something else in the future or not, but you know, just plan out five books. So nice. Nice. Uh Richard, where can uh where can folks find you? I'm going to put a link to the uh to the Amazon page where, you know, that's the most important place for people to go find you. Yeah. Uh but other than that, uh do you have a place where people can come connect with you? You know, uh, Facebook is the best. Just, just go to Facebook and type in Richard Fox author. I'll pop up. You'll see my mugshot right there, and then you just shoot me a note from through through Facebook. So that's the best way. Perfect. Uh, Richard, it's always fun to hang out with you, buddy. Thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hedwig slipped into David's den, the circular reading room. A ladder of crude rungs protruded from the wall, remnant of its days as a grain silo. He pulled himself upward, rung by rung, until the bookcases and sofas were far below. Even if he fell and died, he didn't really care anymore. No, he did care. He couldn't die yet. She had to die first. That would make their divorce final, if she wanted it so much. Darkness enveloped him. He reached the top of the ladder and stepped off onto a catwalk of black mesh, lit only by the faint light of the four square windows that encircled the turret. From this perch he could see the exit she would use. He felt like an assassin, like Lee Harvey Oswald in the window of the Texas School Book Depository. But he wouldn't use a rifle, no, Rifles leave evidence. Rifles can be produced in court. Rifles can miss. He pulled back a shroud of burlap and opened the cardboard box he'd stashed up here earlier that day. He reached into it and withdrew the only murder weapon, the only magic bullet a Van Brunt could ever need. The gold lantern flashed in the moonlight. He held it up to the window. One if by land, two if by sea, he thought and then it's time for a midnight ride. But it won't be Paul Revere. No, not Paul Revere at all. He found the oyster knife at last. He lay his cupped palms sideways over the vent. Don't get blood on your Armani. And stabbed the blade into his palm. The blood came hot. He dripped it into the lantern, where the skull of the horseman waited to sip it like nectar. The reliquary glowed and an incantation in Old Dutch appeared, shining from within the metal. It was time. Hedwig bent and whispered into the vents, Rise, headless, and ride. The letters vanished, and a cold white light burst from the thing. The skull wasn't just a skull anymore. It had gestated. Capillaries clung to it the way fine hair clings to the crown of a newborn. A thick, carotid artery moved with snake-like undulation, drinking blood from the pool at the base, pulling it upwards to circulate through scarlet vessels, through twisting coils, slurping the liquid greedily, the way little Zeph used to slurp strawberry Nesquik through a crazy straw. The blood pulsed and pushed into the nose, into the eyes, into the hollow cavity within the skull. But was it hollow, still? Hedwig didn't think so. He felt a mind growing there, something with a will to challenge his own. He fixed his gaze to the twin caverns of its eye sockets, speaking slowly and deliberately. Jessica Bridge. The death's head grin broadened, somehow, and a thread of black and green liquid, shiny as a horsefly's wings, trickled from the gap of a missing eye-tooth. Only Jessica Bridge. Do you understand? 
He shook the lantern. Do you understand? The face lurched forward and struck the glass, leaving a red splash there. It wobbled and settled, smiling and nodding. Jessica Bridge, hissed the face. Yes. Hedwick raised the lantern a little. Jessica Bridge. The red face tipped backwards and the jaw cracked wide. Hedwick recoiled. Something pink and wet writhed inside that mouth. The nub of a new tongue, salivating as if it could taste the name. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge.